to the extent that we live our lives in a manner that is consistent with the truth in our heart, we thrive. Welcome to the Meyer Clinics podcast, and you just heard a quote from one of your hosts, Dr. Lisa Day. Join our licensed clinical professionals from various backgrounds as they discuss fascinating mental health topics with a wide range of guests. Meyer Clinics is a Christian counseling organization with multiple clinics nationwide dedicated to treating the whole person emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Welcome to our listening family. We thank you for joining us. to welcome our listening family to another episode of Roundtable with Paul Meyer. Dr. Meyer, thank you so much for coming on again with us tonight. I delight, Melanie and awesome. Valerie. Yes, and we also Hi. have our wonderful COO of Mental Health News Radio, Valerie Quintanilla. It's an honor to be here, and thank you so much to our listening audience, and thank you to Paul and Melanie. Yes, yes. So we have, we have shared before on our show that we often don't, we don't have a topic sometimes. Sometimes we do. We really know what we want to talk about and sometimes we don't. So in getting on the phone with Dr. Meyer earlier, I was reading an article that I uh, was posted by a good friend of ours, Shahida Arabi. And the name of the article is Identifying a Psychopath, 20 Subtle and Hidden Signs. And this was, the article was written by Adeline Birch. And it looks like there's actually 21. She drew through the 20 and put 21. So these are going to be 21 signs that we may not always hear about when people talk about narcissism clinically. And I just found these really interesting. So I think we're just going to we're going to read down and and talk about these things, help help people understand, have a more layman's, I guess, understanding of of what what a what a narcissist is and maybe how their personality presents itself. Yes. And, and maybe maybe before we start, I should mention that narcissism is selfishness, you know, and we all have a degree of narcissism because all of us are selfish mm -hmm. sometimes. So there's all different degrees of narcissism. And uh, when we say a psychopath or a sociopath or a narcissist, narcissistic personality disorder, that's somebody that's got an extreme degree of it, you know, usually with little or no conscience. And so uh, we're going to be talking tonight about not just about our own little narcissistic tendencies and things like that, but a, about the more serious kind. But we'll probably get into some discussion of our own, too, <laughs> somewhere down the line. But I just wanted to share that it's a, it's a spectrum narcissism. Yes, definitely. Um, and I, I do, you know, personality disorders in general, and hopefully we'll talk about some other ones, Paul and Valerie, at some point. I'm sure we will. But just in general, when you're looking at a personality disorder, it's something that's pervasive over the person's life and, and definitely interferes with the way they live their life, their relationships, their interactions with other people. So like Paul was saying, everyone has narcissistic traits. We can all be self-centered and, and that can be healthy to a degree because that's what feeds into our self-esteem but way on the other side of the spectrum is uh, is definitely pathology and, and these people can be really confusing to, to people that have a conscience because it's so hard for us to understand how they're thinking or even believe that they can be as cruel-hearted as they actually are. I think that's that's one of the biggest mind tricks is that it's it's hard for someone with a conscience to really understand how and how someone else could be so so cruel. Well, let's start. <laughs> <laughs> let's start. Put on the list. Yep. This first one was was really really caught me, and I I like the way the Adeline Birch was that her name how she wrote the article because I felt like it really gave a a good understanding of of what she was talking about. Number one, they have black leather toughness combined with boyish innocence. This doesn't mean the psychopath literally dresses in black leather. It's more of a feeling that he or she is street smart and has been around the block a few times, but at the same time, they have a sense of girlish or boyish innocence. What do you guys think? Well, they sure <laughs> act innocent. <laughs> you know. Who, yep. me? 
you know. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean it's me? Yeah, what do you mean selfish? How can, how can you dare say that? I've never been selfish a day in my life. <laughs> I give and give and give. What do you mean? Wow. <laughs> you guys are doing a good <laughs> job. I like it. <laughs> Yeah, so Paul, so, Paul, we, we're gonna we're gonna pass the ball to you, Paul, because you're the expert. Yeah. Well, what, well, <laughs> what do you think is behind that that dichotomy of, you know, that toughness, but yet the innis, the innocence as well? Well, what causes a person to become a narcissist in 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 the first place? And I think two thirds of them probably were spoiled growing up. They got whatever they wanted, and and if they cried, their mom gave in, and if they you know, they could manipulate their mom or their dad, and they got away with it. So they could have a, an innocence. You know, if, if they got caught doing something, they could make up some excuse, and the mother or dad would always believe them, let them get away with it. And so they, they learned that, that acting innocent, you know, boyish innocence or girlish innocence. But at the same time, they, they uh, I mean, they're, they're growing in power. The older they get, the more they learn to manipulate and get their own way and and see others as existing for their pleasure and uh and so that's that black leather toughness you know as they gain confidence in their ability to manipulate so they're callous and tough they don't care but they'll act real nice and innocent to, you know they want people to like them and right. so they're not you know they don't go up and say i hate you give me everything you got you know <laughs> they say, I, <laughs> I love you i love you give me everything you got you know? <laughs> yeah, so that little the little child piece has always kind of perplexed me because there is this 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 innocence and and sometimes I think, well, do they present that way because they haven't because that's their maturity level. So to me, it all just kind of makes sense because I, I certainly have known quite a few that they do. They just seem so sweet and innocent, and that really feeds into a desire for you not to want to abandon the person. So like who would want to abandon a child? So if they have this piece of them that seems that way, then it just becomes part of the, how they play on your sympathies, I guess. And then some of them, the other third, so I think two thirds are spoiled right. like that. Yep. And I think the other third were, were severely abused when they were growing up. So, you know, when people get a lot of physical, sexual, emotional abuse when they're growing up, a lot of them turn out great. A lot of them turn out to be really nice people. You know, they they uh, they may have narcissistic parents, and and they and they learn to be nice to cope. You know, <laughs> and uh, but yeah. but some of them turn out. Some of them that are abused repeatedly get so angry and bitter on the inside, and you, you can't. You know, you, you can understand why they would that they that they feel entitled to do to get whatever they want to use whoever they want to use. Uh, they get entitled to just you know have the me against the world mentality, and so they can become narcissistic too. But but they're a little mm -hmm. different than the the boyish childish innocent one that got spoiled growing up. And then what about the rest, Paul? The other percentage. <laughs> I, that's that's the two ways that I know of is that's getting two ways. getting abused. Yeah, so, but I mean, there's a lot of ways. You know, that success is harder to take than failure. They say, and so I think we all, if the older we get, now you guys are really young compared to me, you you know, you could be my granddaughters, you know, but I, or at least my daughters, but the older we get, the, the more we see that, that I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Let's see. What was I going to say? What, what were we talking about? What was the question? And then I'll get back to it. No, but what, I, I oh, asked oh, you. What, how else? Yeah. People how become well? nurses? How oh yeah. Success and failure. Okay. Let me get back to that. Okay. <laughs> Okay, success is harder to take than failure lots of times because when we fail, we can grow from it and learn from it and become better people. And we all know people that got real lucky or got really good at something and, and succeeded and earned tons of money and or, or got lots of fame, and, and they turn into narcissists, and they weren't before. They were nice mm -hmm. people that mm -hmm. become narcissists. And success can go to can go to people's head, and uh, and so lots of times people, if they're in, in even a a, a girl or, or a guy, a, a girl that's real beautiful, exceptionally beautiful growing up uh, may get spoiled, may, may be just as sweet as can be when she's young, and then uh, may get everything she wants and head cheerleader and, and all the other stuff. And, and there's a lot of wonderful, nice head cheerleaders. I'm not saying that they're narcissistic. But <laughs> sometimes a, a beautiful girl or a handsome guy, an exceptionally handsome guy can get whatever they want. And so they get used to getting whatever they want. And so they can make choices to become more 
self-centered or they can choose to be good people anyway and stay good people. So sometimes success will make yeah. people to narcissists. Yeah. And then what do you think about the, the, the studies that we see out sometimes, Paul, that says some people are just born narcissists? Their brains are different than quote. I think we're all born. I think we're all born narcissists. <laughs> <laughs> I think every little baby, you know, yeah. is fighting for his own survival, and and uh, I think we're all born narcissists. I, I don't know if some people are. There's three things that determine our turn, our personalities, uh, when we get older: our our genes, our environment, and our choices. Hmm. And uh, and so narcissism can be. Wow environmentally caused like we were talking about it can be making bad choices like the person who's real successful and he's making bad choices to become more narcissistic or it, it can be genetic and, and some people probably are born more narcissistic from birth on uh, just like some people are born with a greater degree of hostility from day one from from birth on yeah um, some people have different, even different chromosomes that make them more hostile uh, the older they get. And so I'm sure there's, I'm sure we can't, we can't prove it yet, but I'm sure that there's a genetic tendency for some people to be more narcissistic than others. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Valerie, any thoughts before I move on to number two, since we got 21 of these? <laughs> <laughs> sure. My experience set boundaries. This is really hitting close to my heart the way that people respond and the way that they react and all of that. But the hardest part I think about the whole thing with narcissism is that when somebody is not familiar with what that means and then they become familiar and they're, I wouldn't say educated, but they have more information on what's going on, that's probably the biggest hardest thing is that first step. But I wanted to say, and I, we can move on to the next one because I know you've got 21 of them, <laughs> is that the biggest part of it is sitting in the discomfort, setting the boundary, being able to take a step back and look at, I talk quite frequently about how I'm 42 right now and at 41 really began my journey with God. And I know, and so I just wanted to encourage those of you out there that are going through maybe something similar with your family in regards to narcissism, I've read a whole lot of information on it, and I do not want to become obsessed with the information because because if you start looking at it, it's very negative, which is a narcissist. So I just wanted to encourage everybody that it, information is valuable, but at the same time, you have to take that step away and decide what you're going to do. Are you going to sit there and allow the abuse to happen? Are you going to identify what's going on? Or are you going to take the focus off what's going on and, and begin the healing process for yourself? So those are my beginning thoughts. Mm. Well, thank you for sharing, Valerie. And let's talk about boundaries and with narcissists and why they hate boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> Paul? Oh, my goodness. Any thoughts? <laughs> well, they hate boundaries because they, they, they want to rule. I mean, they want to be in control, so they don't want yeah. any boundaries. Um, yeah. But, but I agree with what Valerie said. We need to set boundaries. And, and my clients are often uh, shocked that I would tell them that there's some relatives that they have that they just need to not have contact with and, and, uh, and separate themselves from. Like I've had some that had extremely narcissistic parents that were abusive, you know, very abusive to them, uh, verbally and otherwise. And, and uh, they said, well, the Bible says to honor your father and your mother. Yeah. Well, yeah, in, in, and it says uh, children obey your parents, you know, but, but the, the verse children obey your parents is it, actually in the Greek it says young children obey your parents, little children obey your parents, and, and honor your father and mother. I, I said, well, you can honor them without being with them. You know, when they're old enough to be in a nursing home, you can help, you can send some money to help <laughs> pay for part of their nursing home expenses or something, but you don't have to have any contact with that person at all if they're abusive. It would be wrong to. So uh, sometimes we need to have boundaries and separate ourselves from the narcissist, and, and for sure we don't we don't want to put ourselves put up with it. Something I encourage people to do: if if you're in a relationship, if if you're in our listening family right now, and you're in a relationship where you you fall, you get in, you get sucked into it, you get into arguments with the, your narcissistic uh, buddy or friend or whoever it is. Something that I encourage my clients to do, and something that I do myself sometimes, is if I get in an argument with somebody, one of my friends or, or my mate or somebody, I'll pretend I'll stop and pause for a moment, and I'll pretend like I'm walking outside my body, and I'm standing 
like three feet away observing me and the other person and I'm observing their behavior and, and what's being said and what's going on and and it gives me an objective view of what's happening and then I come back to myself and, and say aha you know I have that aha you know I'm not going to fall for this I'm not going to get all riled up and that's what the other person wants me to do I'm just going to you know I'm going to say this is you know this is the way I feel and you can agree or disagree, but this is the way I feel, and then I'm going to walk off. Yeah, that's that's good advice for sure. It's so hard when it's a family member, Paul. I've had that same experience as a clinician and as a friend. I totally agree. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as a friend, you know, um, it's it, no one wants to hear, and, and it's so hard to put up a boundary because it often changes the dynamic of the entire family, um, mm. and that just makes it so difficult. And then a lot of times when you put up, a boundary with a family member or, you know, maybe someone in a romantic relationship, you put up that boundary and then there's pay, you know, you, you're going to get it. There's going to be some type of withdrawal. Um, there'll be some type of attack later. There's, you will never make a boundary, in my opinion, with a narcissist that you don't pay for it later. They might respect yeah. it for a little while, but somehow it's going to, it's going to come back at you because they, it's just like you said, Paul, they, they want 100% of whatever it is that you're giving them. So you saying no is just, it, it sends some narcissist over into a rage and, yeah. and, and in a I love you, so don't leave me or I'll kill you. Exactly. I love you, so don't leave me or I'll kill you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but then you're scared. If you love somebody, you want what's best for them, even if it's exactly. not you. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So some people are scared to set boundaries because they've tried to set boundaries with the person and it was so horrific or, you know, they were, it, it, they just, well, it's not even worth putting up a boundary anymore um, right. because the the wrath of what happens afterwards is, is so tough, but. Yeah. Well, what's, what's the moral of those 21? Or yeah. we, won't, we won't get. We won't get to them. Okay, this is we a won't really. Get, we won't get to. I know it. This is a good one. Second one. <laughs> okay, number two. Okay. Psychopaths embody incongruency. He or she may contradict themselves from one sentence to the next, or it may take a few weeks for them to completely change their viewpoint. One day they may express sympathy or plight for the homeless, and then 20 minutes later they may say, how could anyone become so worthless and let that happen to themselves? So they're hot and cold, hot and cold, hot and cold. One minute they say one thing, the next minute is something completely different. I've definitely had that experience. How about you, Val? <laughs> the best part about, I think, the whole thing, because this is my wisdom takeaway, is that that person is ultimately absolutely miserable. Probably the hardest part about the whole thing is that when they do say they're sorry, your heart really wants to believe that they are. Hopefully right. um, our listeners will get a real picture of how this can play out in, in real life for sure. All right, let's jump number three. Um, okay. They exude a subtle, definite air of confidence and superiority. Their body language mm -hmm. may sometimes read as haughty. You'll see flashes of it now and again, and you kind of feel like it's out of character. Their physical posture gives off superiority, hidden powers, and an amused indifference. Mm -hmm. um, so body language of, I guess, just being arrogant is what I would call it. Um, Absolutely. Just, you know, nose in the air or chest out or just the way they walk or saunter, you know, any anything um, where they really do feel like they're they're superior to others. They do. They do. Yes. They feel like they're better than everybody else. Everybody yep. else in the world exists for their pleasure. Yeah. So it can't help but come out. They may, again, they act sweet and nice and kind and mm -hmm. all those things. You know, they want to impress people, but their their attitude of superiority is bound to come out in their body language, you know, yeah. their attitude. Hi, this is Dr. Paul Meyer of the Meyer Clinics. Our Christian counselors across the country have a goal of helping all those who come to us to become what God has called them to be. If you're in a situation where you're not at peace within yourself or you just feel like there's joy that's missing in your life, we can come alongside to help you obtain peace and joy. This message is sponsored by the Meyer Clinic Foundation, a nonprofit Christian counseling ministry. The number is 1-888-7-CLINIC, 1-888-7-CLINIC or just how they feel about different situations or, you know, after I read the whole article, I, I felt like a lot of it went back to number two, and that is that they, they embody this incongruency. And that's what you're saying, Paul, is that they may act a certain way, but things just don't add up. 
So you're just kind of confused. You're just kind of confused sometimes. And I think this is so detrimental, especially to a child of a parent that's a narcissist, because they may overtly be saying things like, you're the best child ever. We love you so much. You're wonderful. But all this body language they're putting off is saying, you you mean nothing to me, and I don't really love you. It's, it's just so confusing for the child, because it's this show, but underneath it's not really real. And so then, therefore, you could see how this child would just immediately get into the relationship with another narcissist yeah. as an adult. Yeah. Does that yeah, make sense? Look, yeah. Yeah, they look down on others and other groups of people with disgust. Yeah. You know, they, 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 they just yeah. you know, look down on people. Yeah. They, they, an example is politically is what's going on, and I'm not going to get into liberalism and conservatism and all that sort of thing, but because you know, our, our listening family are all over the spectrum on that. But uh, like at Berkeley right now, the students say, well, we love the poor, we love these people, we love those people, and we need to protect them. And uh, and so somebody like Laura Ingram, a conservative, gets invited to speak, and they burn the place down and knock it. You know, they they'll get in fist fights with people and do everything not to allow somebody else to speak to to give their version of what's going on. And so yeah. that's that's marked uh, where they're acting real nice. But then the narcissism comes out and, uh, in, 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 the, in the behavior. Yes, yeah, that's, uh, and that's what's so confusing about these people. And it's also what I think, it, it intrigues us. It intrigues us as yeah. human beings that to, we want to figure it out. And especially those of us that are kind of hopeful, we always want it to be something that it's not. But it's re- really hard to look at sometimes. All right, number four, they tell you stories of shady or unsavory things they did in the past. They love to tell tales of their business exploits while at the same time you're convinced that they're they're not really like that any longer. So they may tell you like torrid stories of how they were in the past but then claim to, to not be like that anymore. This is an interesting one. One, and I've read this one a lot. Number five is psychopaths need little sleep. They're always on the go in their quest for some type of stimulation. They generally don't need any more than four to five hours of sleep a night. Had you heard that one, Paul? I never heard that. No. Yep. Wow. They need little sleep. But, but you're right. They're always see, they're always uh, um, seeking stimulation. That's for sure. Yeah. But I didn't know that. Yeah, that's an, I, I've read that one before. Number six, they sometimes exhibit unconvincing emotional responses. Most of the time they can come across as genuine, but the other time you get the feeling that they're just a bit off or engaging in some type of play acting. This can pertain to facial yeah. expressions, body language, or tone of voice. So again, I think it's that contradic- yeah. contradictory. They're saying one thing, but their body language is telling you something different. Saccharin sweet, we used to call it. Ah. Oh, you poor thing! <laughs> you know, ah. I, I used to teach. I used to teach uh, seminary students, and I told them, if you want to know who who has the most hostility in your church, when you're finished with your sermon and people line up to shake your hand on the way out the door, it's the one that says, <laughs> "Oh, pastor, your sermon was so wonderful." <laughs> you know, that's probably the one with the most hostility. <laughs> true. True. <laughs> so their emotional response doesn't match what. You know, what they're really feeling. What they're really feeling. Mm. They're phony. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Number seven, it says they can go from rage to complete calm in, in a millisecond. Emotions are shallow, mm. shallow and short-lived. So that's that narcissistic rage where one minute everything can be fine, and then the next they're raging and you don't even know why. People that are going through narcissism, and whether they're sociopath or not, they're not really going to sit there and go, okay, I'm a narcissist. Listen to this, and I've heard about this too. They drop hints of their true nature. These are called tell. So it's a narcissistic tell. So someone might well, how would do you say, spell that? T-E-L-L, T E L L, T E L L, like tell. it's a telling you. They're they're telling you oh, who they really it's are. Tell. Oh, oh, a tell, yeah, tell, like tell. a tell. T E L L S. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And so the person might would say, you would be so easy for a con artist to do because you're way too trusting. Or they might would say something like, "You need to be wow. ca- you need to be careful because the devil can present himself as your best friend." I had someone <laughs> say to me once, and I should have turned around and ran <laughs> when it was said to me. But they literally <laughs> said to me, "You're like a sweet little innocent lamb 
and I'm like the big bad wolf. Literally, <clears throat> they said that to me. And I was, was codependent <laughs> me was like, oh, no, oh, really? you're not a bad wolf, you know. <laughs> but there was like a smirk on their face when they said it. All the while, they're sitting there yeah. holding me. And it was just confusing. But it was definitely a narcissistic tell. He was telling me exactly who he was. So relationally, I had through the years, you know, I, I've raised my son since he was three um, without a father present. And, you know, I went through many different relationships, seeking validation outside of myself, you know, outside of God. All of the things that I was trying to fill, all the voids have been filled by my God. The, the Bible, the Bible says, Proverbs, Solomon said, hope deferred makes the heart sick. sick. Yep. And, uh, and then so many of my you know, uh, depression is anger turned inward. And so many of my, my depressed patients have a, a mate, like, for example, a mate that ran off uh, with another uh, woman and, and, and he's been living with her for three years. And, and she'll say, well, I just know he's coming back. I just know he's coming back because me and my friend are both praying that, that he'll come back. And, uh, and I said, well, mm, I don't think um, he's going to come back. And they, and they get mad at me and say, well, yeah, but, you know, uh, if I pray that he'll come back, he's going to come back. I say, well, God can make anybody do anything, but he doesn't. He gives us a free will. And and the odds are that he's not ever going to come back. As long as she has hope that he's going to change and he's going to come back, she's going to stay depressed because hope deferred makes the heart sick. Right. And so, and, and right. so even though I'm a Christian psychiatrist, my goal with her is to get her to accept the fact that he probably won't. I mean, it's, it's anything's possible. I'm not saying 100% that he won't. But it's 99% that he won't, you know, and, and, and uh, she needs to give up on it in, in order to get over her depression. You can turn around and lean on God and say, you see what's going on. You understand what I'm feeling in my heart. And I do not want to be a victim because I don't have to be a victim. I know that there's steps that I can take now to step out of what's going on and to sit back and go, okay, I don't want this for myself. It's okay to take a step away to heal, to be able to, I wouldn't say project, but to be able to, to sit back and analyze in non-judgmental way, but to sit back and go, okay, this was something that I didn't see before, and this is something that I'm, that I'm looking at now, and I believe with all of my heart that God is going to see us through. Okay, this, these next ones are really interesting. So, and we've kind of talked about this. Number nine would be flashes of content contempt and they talk about what is called micro expressions which are just a, a flash of a look on someone's face that disappears in milliseconds so it's that same devaluing and contempt number 10 they have deviant sexual desires and they want you to fill them whether you want to or not plenty of normal people have deviant desires but a psychopath will be more aggressive in trying to fulfill them this one is really interesting and it's so funny because it makes me think did you ever have one of those friends that always had on too much perfume or cologne? Did either one of you ever have a workmate? Or just, <laughs> did you ever have one of those yeah. friends? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're supposed to be seen, not heard. Right. <laughs> Number 11, they have a poor sense of smell. Individuals who scored highly on psychopathic traits are more likely to struggle to both identify smells and tell the difference between smells. So they have a poor Never sense of smell. <laughs> it uh, makes me think about several people I know that just like you can't even stand being around them because it's just so strong. Their cologne is. It makes so their personality sense. stinks, but you can't. They Pretty can't much, smell other but things. But they right? can't smell it. That's right, Paul. <laughs> That's funny. You know, on that going back to that deviant sexual desire thing. Yes. Yes. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of that they say. You know, a lot of a lot of guys will say, I love you in order to get uh, sex. And a lot of girls will give sex in order to get love. Yes. And, uh, and, and, lots of, and, and both of them might be using each other. But if I, I, tell, I tell young ladies when they're dating, you know, if you really want to know if, if the guy loves you or just wants to use you for sex, just don't let him have it. Don't let him have any and see what happens. Yeah. And if, it, if he's a narcissist, he'll dump her in a minute. Yeah. And if, if he's if he's a good guy, then he'll learn to love her for who she is rather than just just want to use her sexually. Yeah. Boy, if some people could listen to that, Paul. <laughs> 
things would be a lot different, I think. Yeah, amen. <laughs> yeah, no joke. Their speed. The best way to find out if the guy yeah. you're dating is a narcissist. Yep. Just say no. Just say no. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> if he goes away, he's a he's a narcissist. It's not worth it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I agree wrong. with you. Probably. <laughs> well, it probably would just. Gosh. You wouldn't waste so much time with a lot of folks, that's for sure. And it could be the other way around, too. Yeah. You know, some women are very forward as well. So oh, yeah. um, certainly something to think about. Their speech is filled with disfluencies. Psychopaths may have a lot of breaks in their speech. The exact reason for this isn't clear, but researchers speculate that they might be trying harder to make a positive impression. So they need more time and mental effort to frame a story. This one's so really interesting. Yes. Is that what that means? They pause? Yes. Because they're trying, they're trying to create the story in their head. Yeah, yep. Of how they want to convey it. Yeah, okay. yep. That's interesting. Well, this makes sense to me. They can't describe an emotion or their personal experience of one. Here's an example. Let's see. This is a, a Dr. Robert Hare who has a book called Without Conscious. This is a conversation he had with, with a narcissist. It says, he said, when I rob a bank, he said, I notice that the teller shakes or becomes tongue-tied. One barfed all over the money, the narcissist says. She must have been pretty messed up inside, but I don't know why. If someone points a gun at me, I guess I might be afraid, but I wouldn't throw up. When the psychologist asked to describe how he, was, how he would feel in such a situation, his reply contained no references to body sensations or feelings. He said, I'd give you the money. I'd think of ways to get the drop on you. I'd try and get my butt out of there. Then the psychologist asked again, how would you feel, not what would you would think or do? He actually seemed perplexed. Yeah, that yep. makes sense. Yep, makes sense to me too. N yeah, they are totally, they don't even understand them, I don't think. This is another interesting one. They have a reduced startle response. This is apparently related to decreased activity and the Bigdala. Amygdala. The amyg amygdala. Thank yeah. you so much. Amygdala. Yeah. A structure yeah. in the amygdala. brain. Thank God we have Paul. A structure in the brain <laughs> related to fear and other emotions. That's interesting, Paul. What do you think? Our conscience. I think our, I think our conscience is, uh, a, a lot of it is in the amygdala, too. Amygdala. I need to say yeah. that like 20 yeah. times. <laughs> yeah. Amygdala. It's the seat of our conscience. So what was that one again? They have a reduced... Startle they have a response. Startle response. Yes. That means if you drop something behind them, they're not going to yep. jump. We got all sorts of tests. Turn around and look. Yeah, yeah, Paul. We need to like make a list. If you want to know if your friend or you know huh. walk behind them and drop something, or see yeah. if they know can recognize the smell of a banana or something. You know, we've got all these <laughs> <laughs> this cool stuff. Um, yeah. They may participate in dangerous activities or extreme sports. Definitely. Yep. This is a good one. Yeah, they uh, invade your yeah, personal they, space. When they drive, yes. you know, a narcissist driving, you know, reckless driving would be typical. I mean, when you're driving down the highway and the speed limit's 70 and you're cruising along at 71, 72 or something like that, and, uh, and somebody whizzes by going 110 and they're darting back and forth lane to lane, well, that person's got to be extremely narcissistic unless, unless their uh, wife's giving birth to a baby or something, you know, or they're about to die or something. But barring a, a, an extreme, barring an extreme, it's a, it's a narcissist doing that. So they do dangerous things. They do do dangerous things. Yeah. They feel invincible. Yes. You know, I they think I, hurt. yeah, I read one time, Paul, that the, uh, the highest, I guess, uh, career, uh, of the highest rate of narcissism is a neurosurgeon. So oh, brain really? surgeon, yes, brain surgeons are more likely to be narcissists than any other profession. I've read that. Really? Yep. That's yep. Surprising. Interesting. Well, think of the confidence you would have to have, Paul, to operate yeah. on someone's brain. <laughs> that's true. You know, I mean that that's uh, takes a, <laughs> it just takes a different I, type of person. I know, person. and I know, I know Ben Carson personally, and he's a yes. real humble brain surgeon. Yeah, that's one of the best in the country. So there's exceptions Good. to that, I know. But, <laughs> but that's that's interesting. Most doctors actually are are pretty conscientious, but but uh, there's a lot. There's plenty of doctors that have uh, MD D degrees. You yes. Know. Uh, <laughs> God, I call it God complex. Yeah, <laughs> yeah God complex. Yeah. Oh boy. So dangerous um, activities. Okay. Yep, dangerous activities. So we're on, we're we're working our way down, aren't we? We are. We're on 16? We are. 
we're on number 16. They invade your personal space. If Definitely. someone just stands too closely to you. Yep. Mm. And says, let me read this. I haven't read this. Research oh, yeah. for they'll, they'll, put their hands, they'll put their hands on you and, and, and yeah, they'll invade your space because your space is their space. Yes. Go, they don't go believe ahead. What were you going to say? Well, I was just reading what it said here, something about cold heart. I think it's way too complex for me to read the whole thing. But that makes sense to me. Yeah, they, they feel they, they deserve to be in your space probably. Yeah. Um, or like that your person that, their space. yeah, that person that hugs you when, you don't even really want them to, or that person that constantly tickles you or something when you don't really want them yeah. to, and they can't pick up on the cues that you don't want them to. Put their hands where they shouldn't be putting exactly, them. Exactly, exactly. This is a good one, I think. They have an eerily calm demeanor. What do you think? <laughs> They're confident. Yeah. So they'd, be, they'd be more calm. I guess they would be calm. They don't mind danger. Yeah. They believe in their ability to manipulate their way out of whatever's happening. Yeah. I can see why they'd be more calm. You know, those of us who are who have strict consciences might be less calm because we'd be afraid we'd make a mistake or hurt somebody's feelings. Yeah. Or, you know what I mean? <laughs> That's yeah. what I was thinking. If you don't really have feelings, you don't have a conscious, and you're not don't really yeah. have empathy towards others, then what do you even have to yeah. be? not calm about you know what i mean yeah. what is there to be afraid of <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly that makes sense they have a saintly aura that they create for themselves mm. they may engage in phony altruism by donating or volunteering handing out dollars to the needy if you were there to witness it they'd be sure to tell you all about it later while smiling and waiting for your adoration <laughs> you know when jesus uh when jesus was on earth you know who he preached against the most who the religious leaders, the yes. scribes and the Pharisees, yeah. the religious yeah. leaders, and yeah. he said, uh, he said, when you make a donation, you you have somebody blow a trumpet. You know, <laughs> they did. They they actually did <laughs> I that. Know. Back then. I know. They, they they'd have somebody blow a trumpet so that everybody could watch them put a bunch of money in the offering plate. You know, and he said the the widow who has two mites, you know, two pennies, and and donates that secretly without anybody seeing her. She's the one that's giving the most, and yeah. uh, and and it's it's true that the uh, narcissist acts saintly, and they'll do all sorts of wonderful <clears throat> things. And there's a lot of them that are in uh, in uh, full time ministry. There's yes. a lot of there's a lot of pastors. I mean, most again, don't misunderstand me. Most pastors are wonderful people. Most doctors are really nice people, but there's doctors that are narcissists, and there's pastors that are narcissists, and and. Uh, uh, we learned that in in residency when I was at Duke that there there might be more people in uh, full time ministry that are narcissists than any other profession. Yeah, yeah. I you mean know, they go around they raise money so they can yeah. uh, they raise support. Uh, like I I knew one guy that was a a narcissist who thought he thought he was holy. You know he wasn't just mm. pretending. He really thought he was holy and, <laughs> and he raised support because he wanted to be a full time prayer warrior. So he wanted people to to you know pay him 50,000 a year to just pray hmm. and uh you know wow. and <laughs> he was really being narcissistic and you know, he wanted to be able to do nothing and and get paid for doing nothing and and at the same time feel important yeah well it's a perfect rouge you know it's a perfect uh perfect thing to hide behind is religion when you're a narcissist yeah. mm. this is interesting and this feeds right into being a being a pastor their speech is prolific they can deliver running monologues that are frequently very intriguing. So they just talk on and on, and they, they're great storytellers. They, can, they have good stories and are good at monologues. This is interesting, too. They have little to no body odor. This is purely anecdotal. Many of them shower frequently wow. or may even carry deodorant or an extra shirt. Some seem naturally <laughs> fresh-smelling even after running five miles. Wow, that's interesting. So they want to stay extra clean. Very. That's weird. So it's not that they don't. That's not that they don't sweat. It's just yes. They ma they they maintain personal hygiene. They take really lots well. of showers, I guess. That's strange. Yeah. I wonder why. Cause well, because <laughs> they want them, they 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 want to uh, they want to manipulate. They they want especially the opposite sex. Yeah, that's true. You know. Yeah. Unless they're homosexual or something, then subconsciously you know, they want to seduce Ugh. others. Subconsciously, they know they're dirty. That's why. <laughs> it could be. It could be an unconscious thing. You say that everything is in your subconscious, so maybe they just feel yeah. so dirty they're constantly taking showers, right? 
It could be. <laughs> this is our last one. So number 21 is your, curi your curiosity has been engaged. The psychopath captures your attention. Even though you may have had no interaction, you feel captivated, and although you won't be able to figure out why that you took notice, you'll wonder about it. They seem to have captured your attention even while doing the most mundane thing, just standing there. Mm -hmm. hmm. Interesting. Makes sense. Yep. Yeah. And then it just says... They're, they're, they're smooth manipulators. Yep. And that's what it says, Paul. What it really means is that they subconsciously, you detect there's something different about them. And even maybe that there's that they're a threat. That makes sense to me. So you're intrigued. I created a, a movie star uh, one time who, and I may have told you all about her before, but I'll, mm -hmm. I'll say it again anyway here. But I treated a movie star once who um, was depressed because she was going through her seventh divorce. And she was in her late 30s and going through her seventh divorce already. And uh, every time, all seven husbands were nar extreme narcissists. And they all ran around on her and they bragged about it and they beat her up if she complained. And, and, and yet when she dated them, they were all real nice to her. Mm -hmm. And so, but she'd go in a bar or at a, to a party or she'd go to even to church or wherever. And, and if she was single, she'd go and somebody would grab her curiosity. They, she, somebody would grab her attention. And it's like she had antennas coming out the back of her head saying, I love you. You're the one. I love you. You know, so <laughs> there'd be some, some guy that would come along that would act real nice and be polite and, and nice to her, but her, her antennas would be able to sense that that person's a narcissist because you can't marry seven in a row like that, you know, and call it bad luck. When I met her, usually I, when I do a workup on somebody, I, I spend about an hour or a little longer and I ask them about their childhood. But for her, I said, let me, let me, uh, instead of asking you about your childhood, let me guess what it was. She mm. said, go ahead, guess. And I said, well, your dad was a, an alcoholic. And she said, yeah, how'd you know that? And I mm -hmm. said, I was just thinking, I said, your, your dad uh, beat up on your mom. Yeah, how'd you know that? I was just guessing. And uh, how old were you when your dad sexually abused you? And she, then she got, she mm. got shocked and she got angry at me. She said, I've never told anybody about that. How'd you know that? I said, I was just guessing. Because, you know, if you marry seven guys in a row that are like that, probably you had, you know, the odds are really high that you had a dad like that because uh, we, we, we tend to have crushes on people that are similar to the parent of the opposite sex most of the time. We don't always do that, but that's the most common pattern. So at first she got mad at me and, and fired me, but then the next day she came back and said, you know, I, I knew you were absolutely correct, so I'm, I'm back here and I want to learn how can I avoid being codependent on, on narcissists. Mm. But she was curious. You know, she'd meet somebody, and something about their manners, their mannerisms and things would, would make her really attracted to that person, curious about them and attracted to them. And, uh, and yet she couldn't see that it was the narcissism that was, mm. you know, sucking her antennas. Well, I guess she was uh, constantly looking for one of them to – to really love her yeah. like her father should have, right? So she kept giving her right. dad chances. Yeah. Like, you know, she kept giving that, yeah. her dad a chance. Yeah. That's right. She wanted somebody like her dad to love her, to, yes. to, to feel what she never got. Or she wanted to be able to fix her dad. Yeah. And so she married these people thinking, you know, once she found out what they were like, she, she kept trying to change them. And she couldn't. And uh, so she had to give up on that. Yeah, I think one thing, too, just ending, um, I guess we can all kind of give one thing that we feel like might would be a red flag that the person's a narcissist. If, if someone ever does anything for you that makes you feel uncomfortable, that's like so nice, maybe you've just met them and it almost seems inappropriate what they're doing, but you don't really know what to say and you just accept it, that might be a little red flag for you. Sometimes people are just genuinely nice, but if it actually makes you feel uncomfortable, I think that's definitely a, a red flag for you because that's kind of that love bombing Absolutely. stuff that they do. Just that general feeling of being uncomfortable, but not knowing why. What's your word of wisdom, Val? <laughs> you have a, a final, so final I've, word so of I've, wisdom? I've, my final words are that it's, it's definitely something that I've experienced. And in addition to that, pay attention to the red flags. Pay attention to your knower. I used to have a pastor that said, you know in your knower when it's wrong. A lot of us negated that. And it just causes extreme pain, a lot of problems. So pay attention to your knower. 
Yeah, that's good. Mm, that's good. People that listen to us uh, today, hopefully uh, those of you in our listening family know a lot more about narcissism today. I know a lot more as a result of this past hour because a lot of these things I'd never heard before. So put these things in your knower and, uh, mm-hmm. and, and observe around you. And, and, and don't assume the best about everybody. And don't assume right. the worst about everybody. And my, my final word of wisdom is that even though most narcissists, very few of them ever change, some do. And I've had some patients who are narcissists. Narcissists are not happy people. They, um, they may have a lot of money. They may have position and power and fame and, and, uh, and all the sexual gratuity they want. And, and, uh, and, you know, they, but they're not happy because the only way to be happy is to love and be loved. And so right. when they come for treatment and they're, and they're real depressed, they're clinically depressed, they can't figure out why, and we do psychological testing on them, and, and then instead of saying you're a narcissist, I'll say, well, according to this test, you come out in the 99th percentile for narcissism. What do you think about that? Here, here's what it is. Here's what it is. Does that sound like you? And sometimes, they'll, sometimes they will see that they are one, and, and, they'll, and they'll see it, and they'll say, and, and I'll say, you know, if you really want to be selfish, then, then you'll do what's good for you. you. You'll do, you'll, if you really want to be selfish, you'll do what's going to give you a happy life. What's going to give you a happy life is to give up on your selfishness and learn to love and be loved. And, and it makes sense to them that it, it, that's really a, a good way to be healthily narcissistic is by giving up narcissism, if that makes any sense. It sounds yeah. paradoxical, but, but and some of them decide they're going to change and they're going to learn, learn to love and be loved, quit manipulating and and try to get over their traits, and and they need to get in group group therapy is is uh, sometimes better than individual even, but they they need to get in a therapeutic relationship where where they get long term outpatient counseling or outpatient and group therapy where people are pointing out to them when they are behaving uh, narcissistically so they can see it. But but I've I've known some that have changed uh, dramatically and really become good people. So I want to offer a little bit of hope. Uh, Don't count on it because most people don't. Most people don't and won't and don't want to. That's uh, that's some good psychology there, though, Paul, to to make the narcissist work to be not narcissist by becoming a narcissist. That's some reverse psychology for you there. I like it. I like it. If you really want to be happy, then stop being so selfish. I mean, that that's a good point because I think a lot of times they are real intelligent in some ways. And if I like, if you can work towards their logic, then that that might be a great way to reach uh, reach people. Paul, you might have another book on your hands because right. there's a lot of people yeah. that that write about treating narcissism, and uh, that might be one of the best ways. I think <laughs> for sure. The most selfish thing I can do as far as wanting what's best for me is to learn to love, genuinely love and be loved. Yeah. Yep. And not be a narcissist. Yeah. Well, thank you both for coming on tonight, Valerie. Thank you. And Paul, as always, thank you for coming on and sharing your knowledge. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, All right. Melanie. And for being a sharing, spirit Sharing who you are. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing your knowledge and who you are. Oh, sure. Sure. It's very easy. (laughs) Very easy with you two, for sure. All right. Well, thank you again to our Mental Health News Radio listeners, and have a good night. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. Tune in next time for another engaging discussion on relevant mental health topics. If you have any questions about Meyer Clinics, please visit our website at MeyerClinics.com. That's M-E-I-E-R Clinics.com or call us at 888-7-CLINIC. Don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or any of your favorite podcast apps. And please note that we are a member of and produced by Mental Health News Radio Network, mhnrnetwork.com.